This is problem number six. On this problem, the key information is the object is in, equil is in equilibrium. And it says several forces act on the object. If that's the case, then the net force must be zero. Anytime the net force is zero, you have to have zero acceleration. And the net force acting on it has to be a zero if you're in equilibrium. Now, the object can be at rest or moving at a constant velocity. Do not get this comp uh, confused with centripetal velocity or when you're, when you're going around a circle. Because if you're going around in a circle, your net force is not zero. You have to have a force that's pulling you back in toward the center for you to go around a circle. So that is not the case. So the answer here has got to be A. It can only be 1 and 2. Number 10. In this problem, you have a toy spacecraft that's launched directly upward. When the toy reaches its highest point, a spring is released. And the toy splits into two pieces, 0.02 and 0.08. Immediately after the separation, the 0.02 part moves in a horizontal, excuse me, horizontally due east. Air resistance negligible. What happens basically to the 0.08? All right. What happens in this situation is when the object, we'll just do a quick sketch, when it reaches its max, it's come to a complete stop. At that point, the initial momentum in the x direction is zero, the initial momentum in the y direction is going to be zero too. And basically, you say in all three directions. So that tells you immediately that the final horizontal or x, where you want to call it, will also be zero, and the final and the vertical also has to be zero. So if you read here it says the 0.02 part moves horizontally. So if the horizontal, if the 0.02 is say this piece here and it splits off and it moves due east with a velocity, then the other piece that's left over, the larger piece, the 0.008 piece, excuse me, 0.08 piece, let me change this, this is point O2. It's point O2. It's not, not point O2. This piece has to go back this way, and this velocity here, we'll call it the point O8, will be less than this one here because the product of this and the product of this have to be the same magnitude. One goes one direction, one goes the other. It has to cancel out because we know this. This has to be the same. So when we look back through these answers that we have, number one says it could move north immediately. No, that's incorrect. It cannot move north because the other piece did not move south. It takes longer to reach the ground. No, because the horizontal velocities has no effect. Excuse me, let me get rid of this. Has no effect on how long it reaches the ground. It strikes the ground far further or farther from launch point than the O2. That's not correct. The O2 will go further because it has a greater velocity than this one. So this is incorrect. So the answer in this case would be A. So when you have problems like this where you have explosions, just remember the conservation of linear momentum has to be held in all directions. All right, next problem. Now this problem is a little bit interesting here. This one you have a student initially stands on a circular platform that is free to rotate without friction about its center. So just draw a circle here. This will be the center. And you have something that's rotating around that center. And let's we'll draw a circle representing the boy here. Okay. So we have this object. Let's say it's spinning around like this. Okay. The boy here has a tangential velocity as the boy is going around. Tangential is going to be perpendicular to the radius. I'll draw a straight line out from that one. And I'll change my arrow so it looks a little bit more perpendicular. Okay, if the boy, it says student jumps off tangentially, tangentially, for the boy to jump off, the boy has got to push off with some type of frictional force. So in this case, the frictional force would go back this way. So the boy is going to push against the friction against the platform that direction. The platform is going to turn around and push that direction back on the boy. So if the boy comes off like this, in this case here, 
and we treat this as one system because it said the student platform system. If we treat all this as one system, then the angular momentum will be held, meaning that the angular momentum here as the boy jumps off will decrease, but the angular momentum of the boy in respect to the center will also increase, but this, the change will be the same, so there will be no change in angular momentum. Now the linear momentum. Now there's, they're talking about the student platform system. Initially there was no linear momentum. There's only angular momentum as this boy is going off. But if the boy pushes off with friction, his linear momentum will change. Now what would happen would be if the boy is pushing off here, he's pushing against the platform. The platform's pushed is attached to the earth. So the earth's linear momentum and the boy's linear momentum will be constant. They will cancel each other out. So in effect, the force required to push the boy to make his velocity go this way, the boy's pushing back, would actually shift the velocity of the earth slightly back the other direction. So the linear momentum would be held constant with the student earth system, but not with the student platform system. And then if you think about the kinetic energy, there is a frictional force that's taking place here. There's work being taken it's being done to the uh, student platform system by the boy pushing off here. The kinetic energy would not be help, would not be constant. So the answer can only be number one, and that would be A here. All right, number twelve. The easiest way for you to work this is to go to the formula sheet and note that the t uh, period for a pendulum is going to be 2 pi times the square root of L over G. Okay, if we to try to get rid of the square root, if we square both sides, I will get TP squared is equal to 2 pi, let's give me a square of that too, 2 pi squared times L over G. All right, so all of this, do some blue, all of this is basically our constant times our L. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so it says which would result in a straight line fit of data. If you're graphing t the uh, period squared versus L, you would get a straight line. So the answer has got to be D in this case, because that's the only type of relationship you work. You look. You excuse me. The only type of relationship you have here. Again, if you took this and you plotted this, you would get some type of linear type relationship here. If, you're, if your length is zero, you have no period, it would be something like this. All right, number 13, the comet moves in the sun in the gravitational field. Now what we know here is the Earth has an angular velocity, excuse me, the sun has an angular velocity here. Everything around it is traveling the same number of radians per second at any point in time. Now as you move further away, your tangential velocity changes only because the radius is. The equation for angular momentum is going to be the symbol L, and it's going to be the product of moment of inertia times our angular velocity. Now our angular velocity will be constant throughout so what's going to happen here is we are going to have constant angular momentum. The only way that angular momentum is going to change is a, re is a result of torque being applied to the system. There's no torque being applied with a comet traveling around the Earth's system. Everything else would be false. So in this case, angular momentum will be conserved. No torque has been applied to the comet. Um, problem 14, I'm going to show you two ways to do this. The first way is the long way, and this is based upon the equations that's given on the formula sheet for the AP exam. Here we have satellite X here, and here we have satellite Y. If you draw a free body diagram of satellite X, the only thing you're going to have, the only force that you have being applied is going to be the force of the gravitational attraction, attraction between the planet and X. So we can call this our force of gravity in respect to x. 
Now this is going to have equal to mass times acceleration. So off to the side, I will put mass of x times the velocity of x squared over r. So really what you're doing here is setting these two equations equal to one another. Again, x is going to have some type of velocity going around this circumference here. So if we go back and we use a gravitational um, attraction equation as far as the force. That would be big G times the mass of the planet times the mass of x over, and it says the radius is going to be r, I believe, right here. So we know this distance from here to here is r. So we say r squared is equal to the mass of x times the velocity of x squared over big R. Now here we can simplify quite a few things. The R is gone here, the 2 is gone here, mass x is gone and mass x is gone. We end up with an equation that says that g times mass of the planet over R is equal to vx squared. All right. Now there's another way to write this. We know that planet X travels 2 pi r in a p one period. So we can say, letting the circumference be 2 pi r, we can say that Vx times its period is equal to 2 pi times the radius. And it's always good to, do, to note this and often use this in the substitutions, especially when you're looking for something reg regarding just r. Substitute that back in. Well, actually, let's solve for vx. We know that vx here would just equal to 2 pi times big R over t. Now let's take this and substitute it back in for here and write the other equation. We got big G times mass of the planet over R is equal to, and we're going to square everything here. That's going to be 4 pi squared big R squared over t squared. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to solve for um, r. So we'll bring the r's up. I got r cubed here, and we're going to bring everything else to the other side. So that's going to give me big G, mass of the planet, t squared here, bring it up to the top, over 4 pi squared. All that is going to equal to r cubed. So we'll take the one-third power of that. That's what r is going to equal. All right, <clears throat> now we go back and you read in the text and it says satellite y completes one orbit for every eight orbits completed by satellite x. So y, x is going around this thing eight times for every one time that y goes. So we can say ty is equal to 8tx. If it takes the period of x one hour to go around the planet, then it would take ty eight hours. Okay, we're going to go back and we're going to use this equation, substitute back in. And again, we're going to we say that big G times mass of planet, we'll put in the ty for right now, squared over 4 pi squared. Take the cube root of that. That's going to equal to the radius of y. Now we're going to substitute back in. So I'm going to take the ty out here and we're going to put in the 8tx. Okay. So when I square this side here, right here, square this, that gives me 64tx squared. I'll just say 64, right like this. 64, and we'll just leave this as tx squared. Now to when I take the one-third of the 64, I'm going to get 4 big G mass of the planet tx squared over my 4 pi squared is equal to ry. 
All right, so we know, again, we know all this value here is R because we stated right here that this is all, oh, I forgot, let me put the one third back in, sorry about that. We know all this is equal to R. So from that statement, or from this, we can say that 4R is equal to RY. All right, that's a long way version. Now the shorter way, would be to use the, this equation, and again, this equation is not given on the AP exam, but the period of one satellite over the period of another satellite squared is equal to the radius of that upper satellite divided by the radius of the other satellite cubed. And this is a good equation to remember, and it makes this problem much easier. Now we substitute back in, and we can say that Tx over 8Tx, okay, what I'm really doing is this is going to be my period of x, period of y, radius of x, radius of y, squared is equal to the radius of x, which was r, over the radius of y cubed. Okay, when we solve this equation right here, then here the I square everything inside. That gives me tx squared over 64 tx squared is equal to r cubed over r why? Actually, I'm going to. I'll just let's leave this just like this. Okay. What happens here? The this cancels out here. This cancels out here. So then I have one over sixty-four is equal to r over r y cubed. Scroll down. We'll take the one third power of that. The one third power of one over sixty four is one over four. Okay. I saw for R Y. R Y is equal to four. Big R. Again, that's a much easier way to solve the problem. But if you're on the AP exam and you do not remember this equation here then you're going to be forced to solve it by using the summation of forces equals mass times centrifugal acceleration. All right, good problem.